Aloha. And everybody's wondering, with all these injuries, does aloha mean goodbye to the Reds' playoff chances? I'm going to tell you why you're dead wrong, if that's what you're thinking. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Aloha! You are Locked On Reds, your daily source for all things Cincinnati Reds. I'm Stephen Offenbaker. He's Jeff Carr. We love baseball. We love these Cincinnati Reds. We have taken our love of the game, our love for this team, and we have turned it into information for you. Locked On Reds is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's podcast, we are going to discuss if the Reds can weather the storm of injuries that they have been plagued with over the last couple of weeks. We're also going to take a look at the newest Red Santiago Espinal. Hey, I said that right. And of course, we're going to take your questions and comments on this live Aloha Friday edition of the show. This is, in fact, the last Aloha Friday edition of the show for the offseason as we are going to be in regular season mode starting next week because we are just six days away from opening day. And speaking of opening day, Jeff, the lineup is something that we can kind of wrap our heads around now, barring any more injuries. Um, (laughs) And Cross your fingers and knock on wood at the same time. It it would be really easy, you know. I did a. I'm on another uh, one of our friends' podcast today that's floating around out there over at the riverfront with Nate Dotson, and we were talking a a little bit about this today. And you know, just whether or not you know our enthusiasm has been completely wet blanketed. Like, are we just like giving up? Like, where were we beginning of off season, middle of off season versus now? And and while I was I was really in on not only a division championship, but a a postseason run where I landed in that conversation, Jeff, is that I still think they can win this division. I don't know that a deep postseason run is something I'm going to like bet money on now, but winning this division, this particular division, the National League Central with the aged St. Louis Cardinals and the blowing them up Brewers and the same old Cubs and Pittsburgh, um, I think the Reds can still win. Yeah, I don't think that our our fervor has been doused. I think there's been a dose of realism that has settled in. I mean, you would be absolutely delusional to not think that the Reds' margin for error somehow has not shrunk. They have little to no margin for error, and there's, there's a lot of pressure that's going to be put on the guys that are going to make up this lineup, but there's also a ton of pressure, even more so, on the pitching staff, a, a group that, while the bullpen was pretty decent, The starting rotation was vastly below average last year. Some might even say the word bad. So they've really got to get better this year. And now the the, uh, just absolute focus that they need to have to really step up their game has to be amazing. But I think they can do it. And, And it starts off with the guys who are going to be in this lineup. Because as much as it does hurt, to remove Matt McClain, to remove TJ Friedel, and to remove Noel V. Marte all at once, there's still so much talent here. And I think that it's it's very disingenuous to say, well, the Reds lost three players, they're done now. I don't think that that's the case. I think that it definitely makes you have to squint a little bit harder to see a deep postseason run with this team. But they still got so much talent, and it all starts with the man playing shortstop. In fact, there was a bit of uh, surrealism that happened in last night's spring training game where Ellie tripled and Spencer Steer just absolutely blasted a home run. A nice little one-two punch there. I think that that... And, and really, and, and you put India up at the top, I think that's your one, two, three right here. If you look at the lineup without um, McLean, Friedel, and Marte, I think that the top three are India, De La Cruz, and Steer. And then you go with CES still batting fourth, still mashing the ball, still hitting a lot of power. Jamer Candelario fifth, Jake Fraley sixth, Tyler Stevenson seventh. I'm going to slot Nick Martini onto this roster and slot him into the DH spot, and then I'm going to put Will Benson in uh, the number nine spot. I really think that, especially with Josiah Gray on the mound, 
for the Nationals, we're going to see those lefties be a part of this team. And that's where I kind of have Nick Martini being a part of this lineup. But this lineup is still going to move in such a way that they're going to score plenty of runs. It's just about the pitching at that point. So let's talk a little bit about Martini because, you know, I've – I've tried to not get on this hype train that is Nick Martini, but he continues to do things that that warrant you paying attention to him. And I'm curious, how do you envision, obviously against right-handed pitching, but how do you envision getting him enough time while still getting everybody else enough time? Because of all the positions that are injured, none of them are his. So, right. so well, what are you going to do I with think- him? I think that the reason he makes this team, he's going to play DH quite a bit. I think that the DH almost being a rotational piece goes away until TJ Friedel comes back because with TJ Friedel out, with Matt McClain out, you really do put a lot more pressure. I mean, India's playing second base just about every day with this with this rotation mm-hmm. when you're talking about defense. And then you're going to have Will Benson probably playing every day, whether it be center field or right field. And then you'll have, you know, Stuart Fairchild in against lefties, uh, probably replacing Jake Fraley. But against righties, Jake Fraley's in here. And they're probably going to figure out a way to get Nick Martini in the lineup over Stuart Fairchild against a right-handed pitcher. So that's kind of where I see that. I could see an argument where it's, you know, maybe Mike Ford gets DH time over Nick Martini. But at this juncture, with the guys who are currently in this locker room right now, this is how I see the starting lineup playing out on opening day. You know, as long as Ford doesn't end up being like every other Ford I've ever known where it's going to break down halfway (laughs) when you're trying to get where you're going. I I just the scene of the cart happening to get him somewhere around second base and tow him around the rest of the way. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so versus a left handed pitch. Is that a fat uh, joke on a Friday? Come on. It was was kind of a fat joke on a Friday. That's exactly what it was. That's a pot calling a kettle black. So no doubt. Hey, listen, you know, the grab bag comment we got earlier in the week was not wrong. Um, versus a left-handed pitcher, then what are you doing with that DH position? How, how are you filling out this lineup versus a left-handed pitcher? Because there is just a whole lot of lefties. So, and again, I know it's a tiny sample size, but Mike Ford has shown a little bit of propensity to hit lefties. That can't be the, he hit two home runs yesterday. Two home runs yesterday off left-handed pitching in the spring. A left-handed training. pitcher who? Which left-handed pitcher? Which well, guy I from don't which know their single names, A team? But yeah, okay. They were throwing with their left hands. I mean, we always joked you in the past that a left-handed batter in the Reds lineup, it doesn't matter if you're a major league pitcher or not. If you throw with your left hand, you're going to shut down lefties on so the Reds you've, lineup. You've, so you've I feel made like my you point. You made them. my point for me. You've made my point for me is that they're in trouble. <laughs> they are in trouble versus left-handed pitching a little bit to start the season. I could kind of see that. And I think that's why they went and they got Santiago Espinal, which will break him down here in a little bit, which that was a good move. Um, but that was for depth. That wasn't like, hey, we're going to start him a ton uh, of these games. But how you kind of move the lineup, like your key right-handed hitters, <laughs> Debbie, I drive it forward. Um, how you move your uh, <laughs> your right-handed hitters around, like CES, Candelario, um, Stuart Fairchild, Jonathan and India were kind of looking at the ones of like, okay, these are the guys that you can employ against lefties to, to really balance the way that the Reds attack them. But now these guys have to play every day anyway, except for Stuart Fairchild. And he only helps you out in one spot. Like Will Benson's having to play every day. And they've been talking about that to the blue in the face. There's been a ton of reporting about how he's been preparing to do this. So he's definitely playing every day, at least to start the season. If do we see a, a lineup? Do we see a lineup that has both Stevenson and Maley in it at the same time? Would David Bell be willing to gamble the DH spot and have both see, those guys in the in the lineup at the same time? I could see that. I've seen more of a defensive improvement this spring in Luke Maley than I have in Tyler Stevenson. So you could make that argument that if he was trying to stack the lineup with righties, you could move Stevenson to DH and have Luke Maley out there at catcher. Um one thing is for sure, though, they're really going to have to do this. <laughs> this from Nolan. If Mike Ford hits a triple tattooed. this year, I will be getting his face tattooed on my face. That's Nolan. amazing. Um, I'm kind of rooting for a triple now just because I want to see the pics of this. But Isn't that the plot right. of face-off? Like, 
is so something <laughs> like that. Are we going to see uh, Nick Cage come here and be like, what the hell, dude? Um, but it, when <laughs> it comes to this lineup, I think that there's enough talent, even with that. Like, I mean, you're still probably you are talking about one or two holes against left handed pitching in the lineup, but it's still six, seven, very, very solid run producers. And then it all comes down to what the pitching is going to do. All right, Jeff. Well, I'm not ready to give up on this team. I believe no, they can still right. win the division. I believe that at least versus right-handed pitchers, there's still a lot of talent in this lineup, and it's still a very dangerous lineup, and there's a lot to be excited about. And there's more to be excited about because the Reds went out and got a guy. And coming up, we're going to break down who he is, what they gave up for him, and if whether or not we'd like to move. All of that next. Look, we're all trying to save money and, and find ways in which we can help out our wallets. And Ibotta is here for that. Ibotta will help you get cash back on everyday purchases wherever it is that you're shopping. Uh, you can get cash back on literally groceries, gas. Uh, if you go to you know your favorite retail store or something like that, it's a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from all of those and more, and even like beauty supplies and toys and stuff like that. So you can make your, making sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. That could cover the cost of the entire shopping trip by that flight that you've been eyeing or that game that you're dying to go to. Or of course you could also go out on a fancy dinner or something like that, or buy plenty of those Montgomery in brisket uh, hoagies at great American ballpark. I, I cannot wait for those right now. Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code locked on MLB. When you register, just go to the app store and Google play store and download the free Ibotta app and start earning cash back and use the code. Locked on MLB. That's I B O T T A in the Google Play or App Store today and use the code Locked on MLB. And you can get in on all the madness with FanDuel. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on and check it out today. New users can win a $200 bonus bet, $200 in bonus bets with their $5 or more first winning. Wager. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on today. Check out all the different lines that they've got on all of the March Madness that is going on right now, whether it be tournament games or maybe you even want to get into some NBA. But of course, MLB, plenty of that. The MLB futures are out there for everything. I know that they've got the over under on steals for Ellie De La Cruz at 40 and a half. You check that out today. I think he's going to go over on that. I think Ellie's going to have a huge year. And I think that he is going to be a guy that you could throw a couple of bones at over at FanDuel and make some cash off of his performance. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on again. New users with their first $5 or more winning wager get $200 in bonus bets back. FanDuel is going to help you have a, so much fun when it comes to the opening day and all the way up until they cut down the nets in March Madness. Did you know that Locked On has started the first ever 24-7 streaming channel right here on YouTube? If you haven't checked it out today, head over after this. Don't go now. After this and check out Locked On Sports today. They've got you covered 24-7 covering all of the major professional leagues. All of the Locked On national shows about the national sports leagues. Plus every, well not every, but you know, we drop them in every, uh, individual local expert like Jeff and I participates over there. You can get caught up on every sport, every team all the time, 24 seven right here on YouTube. That's locked on sports today. All right, Jeff, we talked about the lineup. They need some help. Nick crawl did make a move. Now it's not splashy. Didn't require a press conference and a Jersey holding, but I think anyway, that it was a solid move in a time of need for a player that can help a little bit. Yeah, Santiago Espinal is a guy that slots in perfectly on this bench because the Reds needed infield depth. Uh, David Bell was talking to reporters the day after Matt McClain decided he needed a second opinion, and he's going out to uh, one of the like country's leading orthopedic surgeons, uh, 
Dr. Neil Elitrash, I think is how you say it. But that's the guy that Garrett Cole went to go see. That's the guy that anybody that has a really bad arm injury, they go and see this guy. So that's not a great sign. But David Bell said after that, he said that Spencer Steer's the backup shortstop. And so Nick Craw was like, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, we're fixing that. And he went out and he made this deal. And I, I think it was a very savvy deal. This is the kind of deal that I feel like the Reds are always on the other side of, where they trade a pretty solid major league player for one prospect that nobody's ever heard of. Like the Reds traded Chris McElvain. And I know there's probably a couple of folks that are just like, well, I've heard of Chris McElvain. But he's 23 years old, hadn't pitched above single A. And they get a guy who was an all-star a couple of years ago, uh, 2022, for the Blue Jays. And he played second base, third base, and shortstop all just last year. And he does it at a a solid, I'm not going to say he's like a gold glover, but you can count on him if you have to call on him. And that is desperately what the Reds needed after this, this just wave of injuries hit the team. Yeah, as you say, an all-star in 2022, he had a tremendous first half in 2022. It really propelled him into that all-star game. He fell off a little bit after the all-star game in the second half, uh, but that's not even his best season. His best season came the year before in 2021 when he had an OPS plus of 113. He was 13% above league average in 2021. He's a career 96 OPS plus guy. So basically right at league average for his career, four seasons uh, from 2020 through 2023, all for the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, you know, when, when it came across that the Reds made a trade with the Blue Jays, Jeff, I got to tell you, my heart, it skipped a beat for just a second until I clicked to see what had happened because I thought, could they? Did they? Would they? They didn't. <laughs> Santiago. For Vladimir Escobar. Guerrero Jr.? Uh, yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking. But no, I like this move, Jeff, because as you as we have seen, what was a strength And we talked about this last year with the pitching, right? Like uh, all these pitchers, what they are going to be great. And then all of a sudden, (laughs) Luis Sessa and Connor Overton, what happened? Okay. So that's kind of the direction we were moving. Nick Carl went out and at least got somebody. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be down on crawl for this move. I am going to be down on crawl for what we're going to talk about in a bit with the outfielders, but, um, with this particular move, you know, I, I I credit him for recognizing that no, Spencer Steer is not going to be the backup shortstop. One, because no. Two, because then there would be nobody left to play in the outfield. And three, because no. And four, because no. Because I really think that uh, that that's something that we keep hearing about Spencer Steer, right? Like his best position is second base, and and he's he really can play shortstop. And it's just like that's that, that fine, whatever. I want him playing left field. Because when you take him out of the outfield, this outfield gets weak. I mean, you got you got Will Benson and you got um, Jake Fraley, and we're squinting really hard at everybody else. Because don't look, we we will continue to say, and I, I firmly agree to it. Like if Stuart Fairchild goes off, and by going off, I mean he had like an OPS plus of one ten or more this year. We'll make some sort of song uh, apologizing and saying we're sorry we doubted you. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to be fine. It's going to be a replacement level, but you don't get excited about that. And while that's the same case, Espinal is slightly above replacement level, but not like crazy higher than a uh, replacement level. But the point was he had to go get depth, which is why I'm with you. We've been saying this all off season. Why didn't he go get depth in the outfield? He just completely ignored an entire position group. And we are of the mindset. And we've said this before that Nick crawl is a driving this ship and B we trust what he's doing, but this kind of seems like an iceberg that he was just running right into. And he decided not to steer away from like I, you could have went and got, I mean, when you saw the deals for Duval and for, and for Michael a Taylor, like those deals didn't look that bad. Why didn't he go do that? And now we're in this position where you have to play one of Benson or Fraley every day. Because otherwise, you're calling up somebody like Clint Capel, or you're you're calling Jacob Herdebees up too early, or you're calling Reese Hines up too early. You know, you're really, really stretching at that point. You know, and, and I want to circle back to to this question from Aaron real quick, Jeff. Um, he says that he likes Indy at DH with Espinal playing a lot at second base. Fair. Um, be fine, right? I mean, we're are we okay with that versus left-handed pitching? Maybe that's our uh, guessing. He's maybe that's our avenue. 
Yeah, I think so because I, I think he's I think he's a better glove. I'll look up some defensive stats on that, but not hard to be a better glove than India at second base, but um right. I could I could see. Well, and while you're looking that up, I, I will speak to what you were saying with the outfield. Uh the fact of the matter is the outfield is what kept me from giving Nick Crawl a, a grade A on the way that he constructed this team in the offseason. Right. We we identified three things when as soon as the season ended, and not just us. I mean, it's not like that we were the the four seers of the future, but you know, anybody that follows this team close to closely identified three areas that they needed to upgrade. That was fix the bullpen, strengthen the bullpen. That was get an additional starter to drop into the mix. And that was go get at least one right-handed power hitting outfielder. Nick crawl did two of three and I give him a solid B plus for what he did in the off season. But you're right. This was an obvious need for this team at the, the end day one of the off season. So this is not like, oh, injuries came up and now I've got to make a move and there's nobody left. This was a need from day one. So the fact yeah. that D Duvall came off the board for as cheap as he did, the fact that Taylor came off the board for as cheap and as, as, as he as did, did. Yeah. and as late as they did, uh, that's kind of a failure. And that that cost you some grades. And um, why he didn't make a move, maybe he'll tell us one day, but um, it doesn't make much sense to me. And I don't necessarily believe that another move is coming between now and opening day. I think they're they're pretty happy. I mean, maybe unless they just decide that one of Martini or Ford ain't it. Because right now those two guys are making the team. Uh, but if, if they make that decision and they go get somebody, I think I'd be a little bit surprised if, if I'm being honest. I did look up, so defensively comparing uh, Espinal and Jonathan Indy at second base, in 2022, Espinal had nine outs above average, so plus nine in the outs above average. India has always been negative on the outs above mm -hmm. average. In 2023, Espinal went negative. He was negative three outs above average at second base, which is strange because the sample size was much larger in 2022 than it was in 2023. So I wonder, I don't know if something was going on there, if he was just getting so far too much, too erratic a playing time for him to really catch a groove. But yeah, I still think, I, I think he's got a point, though. The commenter, and I'm sorry, I forgot the guy's name, but um, uh, he he had has a point here. You could see Espinal playing some second base over India and having India DH and still hitting leadoff. I don't I don't think anybody on this team right now is pushing him for the leadoff spot. All right, Seth. I see Seth in the comments asking about Tony Kemp. Kemp was released, um, well, transferred to minor league camp and then released. So whether yeah, he, he had an out in his contract or or the Reds just released him. He is no longer with the team, uh, nor is Josh Harrison. So, um, and I wonder, you know, Josh Harrison, Kemp, you've questioned the timing on Barrero. Mm -hmm. For a team that was kind of struggling there with injuries, they were kind of willy-nilly about getting rid of folks. Well, and, and that's one, actually, I tell you what, I'm going to answer that here in a minute because I got I got a lot to say about this. I've been thinking about this a lot. It's something that a lot of folks are really kind of like, what what happened here? Did the Reds make the right move? And plus, we're getting to more of your questions and comments coming up right after this. Who's cutting the cord recently when it comes to like cable and all that stuff? Oh yeah, me. Uh, Amazon Fire is the best way to do that. Amazon Fire's got so many options, whether you're talking about uh, live sports or movies or television, they've got it all. And when it comes to sports, they've also got games, highlights, in-depth analysis, and all that great stuff. You've got Amazon Fire TV channels that deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. Locked On is included in your favorite sports brands, I hope especially if you're an everydayer and you can check it out on Amazon fire TV channels. They've also got most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive in to all the game analysis highlights and more. And we'll keep you up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, like with March madness, NBA, major league baseball, and so much more NFL off season news. There's, there's plenty of that going on. Uh, not to mention great, news from the world that's not in sports uh entertainment gaming travel cooking videos i love cooking videos sometimes i just like get done eating a meal and then i go watch another cooking video and i'm ready for the next meal it's probably a problem but whatever fire tv channels is going to help you out with all of that check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices today i, I i'm telling you if you haven't checked out the fire tv channels yet you should trust me on this to learn more, visit Amazon.com slash locked on 
Fire TV. As we get close to the season, make sure that you've got InsideTheReds.com bookmarked on your favorite internet browser. I'll be writing about the Reds over there. Steve's writing about the Reds over there. James Rapine, Caleb Sisk, Rick Uccino, Austin Elmore. A lot of great folks writing about your Cincinnati Reds. Also, make sure you check out the Lockdown Reds Discord page. Got a link in the description of today's episode. Everybody's talking Reds baseball all year long. Got some other channels too, talking about some gaming, some Bengals stuff, all that great stuff. Try to give you a, a one-stop shop for Reds fans that also like to talk about other stuff as well. So the Lockdown Reds Discord page, Seth gave you that, gave the shout out to the Discord page there. All right, Steve. Uh, so you asked me about, you know, my thoughts on the Reds kind of letting go Barrero, letting go of Harrison, letting go of Tony Kemp. Uh, was that short-sighted? I don't think so. And the more that I thought about this, because in the moment when all these injuries started to happen, it's like, well, Barrero can play the outfield. Barrero can play the infield. Why on earth did they cut him so quickly? Uh, Josh Harrison can at least play corner outfield spots. He can play the infield. Why did they cut him so quickly? Why did they cut Tony Kemp and all this other stuff? I just don't think they believe they could help them. And that is something where it falls under the purview of, I trust where the Reds are going with this. I would much rather have Santiago Espinal than any one of those guys. Now you could say that I, I, you know, you could say you could have kept one or two of them uh, for depth. And, and, and especially now with more injuries coming on, maybe they make the roster instead of Mike Ford. But I think when you're trying to argue, should you have Nick Martini, Mike Ford, Josh Harrison, Tony Kemp, or Jose Barrero, like throw those names up into the air, whoever falls, down at your feet or something like that. Those are the ones you pick. I just don't see a huge difference there. And I don't think the reds did either. So they're betting more on the bats of Martini and Ford because they both have more power than any one of those other three guys that have already been cut. And I think that's kind of where they decided to make those moves a little bit early. And, and I know, you know, for Barrero, you didn't have to cut them early, but um, Josh Harrison had a cutoff date in his minor league deal with an invite to spring training of March 21st. Uh, he had to know by March 21st if he was going to make the opening day roster. So they just went ahead and they told him a few days early and gave him some more time to go find somewhere else. Tony Kemp, I think, had the same cutoff. That's why he was already sent down to the minor leagues and given his release and all that other stuff, too. Barrero might be the only one that you could have said, hold him till the end of camp and see what you need. But if you've seen what he's done in a Rangers uniform, he ain't making the Rangers either. So there might be something to this where the Reds were just like, we really wanted to see him make that, make that step and, and become a major league ball player. We just don't ever see him doing that. And I think the Rangers are probably going to concur. Debbie says, should we replace the trainers and medical staff? Too many injuries in the last two years. So I looked this up. I've been talking about this, Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, 2023, according to the Associated Press, the Reds were fourth in baseball with uh, players going to the injured list. Now, that could be the same player going multiple times, but total number of players going on the injury list. So last year in baseball, the San Francisco Giants had the most injuries at 46, followed by the Los Angeles Angels at 42. Um uh, I forget who came in with 39, but the Reds had 38. Um, I don't have it in front of me anymore, but the Reds had 38. They were fourth. They were tied for fourth with 38 players going on the injury list. So they were on the high side. They were fourth in baseball. Uh, you know, injuries happen, right? Injuries happen in baseball. These are professional athletes that, that push their bodies and do things, you know, every day over and over and over. A lot of repetition, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on there. I don't know that the injuries themselves is what bothers me. But I, I will tell you what does bother me. What bothers me is this, the way this team has continued to handle injuries. I feel like, and maybe it's just because it's right in front of my face and we cover this team every day, Jeff, but I feel like that the Reds have a higher percentage of this guy is only going to be out a couple days. We're not even going to put him on the injured list. We'll just play shorthanded. He's going to be okay. It's precautionary. It's just a tweak. He needed a day off. He could totally play if this was a playoff game. Tons of that followed a week later by, um, he's seeking a second opinion for surgery on his shoulder. <laughs> and uh, we'll let you know exactly what that means when we know exactly what that means. Cause we don't have right. a clue. That's kind of the way we see things go more often than not. 
So I, so do they need to make a change? You know, they, they overhauled this training staff, what, three years ago now, two years ago now? Um, they did this once already, and things have not gotten better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, maybe it's time to do it again. Listen, Debbie, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if they just went out and started over on the way that they're, they're handling injuries around here. I, um, I, I think of, I think of Star Trek in times like this. Um, cause it was something that Scotty told LaForge on one of those crossover episodes where, you know, he was on the enterprise D and all this other stuff. And he's talking to LaForge and, you know, Jordy's telling Captain Picard exactly the timeline that it's going to take to repair something so that he knows that's the time to do it. And Scotty's like, no, you got to pump it up. You got to make it seem like you're going to be early. I low key think the Reds need to do this. They need to be like, he's going to be gone for months. And then when he comes back in like a week or two, then they're fine. And there might be like some rules against this, but right now it feels like what they're saying is, all right, there's a range. He could be back in a week. He could be back in six months. So we're going to tell everybody he's back in a week. And that never happens because that's the most optimistic. That's like, he's got, you know, adamantium skeletons that's going to heal himself super quickly but instead there's more close to the the six month range or you know whatever there's more close to the high end of the range that it's going to take a player to come back but we always get the most you know just pie in the sky you know head in the clouds super optimistic almost to the point that it's delusional timeline for these guys that are hurt. And I feel like this not necessarily something wrong with the training staff. It's just the communication. And it's possible that the training staff is the one that is communicating that, Hey, here's your time frame, And then David Bell's like, bam, most optimistic. That's what we'll tell everybody. And well, then all and of a sudden saw that he's with, completely wrong. Right. We saw that with the TJ Friedel thing where they're talking about three to four weeks. Well, no, they're not three That's to four weeks look at the cast. is when they're going to decide how long it's going to be. There's yeah. no medical person said he'll be back in three to four weeks. No one no. said that they said in three to four weeks, we'll take a look and we'll let you know. And they ran with the three to four weeks. And now people are running with the three to four weeks and TJ Friedel's not going to be back until mid June. It's just mm -hmm. the way it's going to go. So, right. uh, so I, I don't know who to fault here, Jeff, but I do know that the, the handling of injuries with this organization over the last several years, I mean, how many times did I, have I yelled about playing shorthanded? Right. I mean, like nobody the, loves the, playing yeah. shorthanded more than the Cincinnati Reds. It, it just, it boggles my mind. Yeah. Guys, hamstrings like hanging on by a thread and they're like, ah, oh, wait, and he can sit on the bench. He'll, he'll be back in a day or so, but no, that's, that's, that's kind of the rough one there. Jared's kind of with you says the Reds could break camp with Martini and Ford. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Both seem like they have some pop. They do, right? Both of these guys can give you a pinch hit home run against and a right-handed something... pitcher. And if you talk to me about Ford splits one more time, I'm gonna no, I'm, I'm gonna mute you. I'm telling you, there <laughs> there's no. I'm not gonna go crazy on that. But that is something <laughs> that we did not say about Santiago Espinal. He does not have a lot of power. His slugging no, percentage last all. year was in the 300s. So what he does at the plate will be mostly singles and stuff like that. So don't go crazy over you know bold predictions with Santiago Espinal. And I think that's probably why the Reds are okay with having Martini in four, because if you look at the bench, I mean, Fairchild's got some pop, but it's inconsistent. So if you can get a guy like Martini or Ford that you get up there and you feel pretty good about them lacing a line drive to the outfield or maybe even uncorking a home run, then that is something that you need to have on this bench. Because with the bench being decimated as much as it has by these injuries to the starters, you need to make sure that you feel good about something. You're not going to have a guy on the bench. Like remember when we entered camp and we had quotes like, well, the Reds have 11 starters on their team. That's not the case anymore. You've got some bona fide dudes that are bench guys. And when they are bona fide bench guys, that means that there's one or two things that they do really well. And the rest of it's probably only average, if not below average. So if you can get some guys that are really good with the power, then you take everything else that comes with it. Michael checking in. Hey, Michael. He asks, is Crawl banking on Blake Dunn or Reese Hines coming up at some point? I want to answer that, but we're going to do that after we end this portion of the show. This is going to be our first portion of the show for everybody not watching it live. For those of you with live, keep here with us because we're going to continue on with the Q&A, but I want to cut it off here at this point. Thanks, everybody, for checking out this uh, first part 
of the Aloha Live Friday edition of the Locked On Reds podcast. The Q&A portion is coming up a little bit later on. Make sure you check that out because we are going to be Locked On Reds with you here every single 